thanks for taking time out today. Um, I think, um, Loretta, if it's okay with you, because everything starts yeah. with you and, and Lou, um, uh, you know, today is the 28th anniversary of the opening of Luxman Ireland House, but I, I, Terry Galway's history of the house, I'm so glad that we did that. He did such a great retrospective for us uh, in 2018. And um, I had forgotten that it was, you know, it was 1990 or so, if I'm not mistaken, Loretta, when yes. this idea percolated and then the announcement was made in 1991. I know you've done this a million times, but for the record, will you <laughs> tell us a little bit about that context in terms of you and Luxman, you and Lou, Lou uh, making the decision to found Luxman Ireland House? Well, first of all, Miriam, thank you for another one of your brilliant ideas gathering us for this wonderful purpose. Um, thank you very, very deeply. And thank all of you for joining in. It means the world to me. Um, Lou was a trustee and there were many ethnic houses. And when we went to Ireland for the first time in 1985 and literally fell in love um, with the country, with the people, with the um, universities. And so Lou began talking to Larry Tish, who was chairman of the board at the time, about uh, why not an Irish house. And um, one thing led to another. Jay Oliva, who was president at the time, had the great good fortune to have an Irish mother. And so he signed up right away. And Jay and his wife, um, whose name just jumped out of my head. Mary, Mary Ellen, is it? Mary Ellen, thank you very much. Um, and Lou and myself went to Ireland and um, I think that was around 90 or 91, perhaps, maybe 89, I'm not, just not sure. Anyway, was there interest in Ireland in an absolute center in, in, in New York, specifically at NYU? Of course, the Boston program and the uh, Notre Dame program were very well respected and up and running, but there was a lot of interest. And um, so we took that back home and uh, Lou presented it to the board. It was approved. And this is where I really want to get back to get some nitty gritty information. I, Bob, I don't actually recall um, the this sequence of events. I know first we had to do the renovations and but what and I don't guess this is hugely important, but for purposes of expanding again, which we are going to do because it's absolutely uh, necessary. I don't really remember the, the, um, the chronology. So I'm going to talk with some of the people on the building uh, department and um, try to get the nitty gritty uh, facts back together. But that's the way it started because Lou said there should be an Ireland house and Jay Oliva agreed. Oh, first Larry agreed and then, and it just began. And Loretta, um, to, just to bring Lou in, my understanding is that Lou's love of Ireland by at that stage was many decades old, correct? Very much. Lou uh, lied to get into the Navy in uh, World War II and he was 17 years of age and uh, was assigned to an icebreaker in the submarine service in the North Atlantic. And he had the great good fortune to have an Irish, uh, I forget the, the officer's name, not, not an, uh, a big guy, but you know, the, sort of like the quartermaster in the, in the army, the guy that looks after the provisions and that the, the ship is running well. So Lou fell in with this fellow and he was Irish. And so lots of dark days and dark nights in the North Atlantic. He spoke to this man about Irish literature and that was just a wonderful seed that was planted, total serendipity. And Lou was always a, a phenomenal, uh, voracious reader. And um, so this man became his um, literary coach and he read his way through World War II. Amazing. And thank God came home. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and Loretta, I suppose 
um, there was some luck in that context as well, because uh, as I mentioned, I was rereading Terry's fabulous history of the house and I was reminded and, uh, you know, we've just lost uh, the great Dennis Donahue and uh, yourself, Bob and Dennis um, were well ensconced at NYU, you in the history department and Dennis in English. Can you tell us a little bit about those early mumblings about the formation of something that would become Luxman Ireland House and how you got involved in that? It was a mystery to me in the very beginning. Dennis and I were invited to speak to the then president of, of NYU and uh, for the first time we heard about the new Ireland House. <clears throat> had no idea what its purpose was at first, except that it was a great location, a lovely house. Uh, and for the first year, the house wasn't quite finished. So Dennis and I came up with uh, an unimaginative schedule featuring me first and Dennis second, right? We gave the first two lectures and, and that's about all we could do. We had a few events and some music, of course. And then within one term in the fall of 1994, the year after, so we had a list of 15 events with some, let me just, I, I came across it when I was reviewing. This is the first real year in spring 94. Here are the list, just a few of, of the list of our guests, starting with Peter Quinn, Banished Children of Eve, that book just came out. Seamus Heaney, next. Kevin Whelan, next. Nuro Nadonal, next. Bill, William Fishman, who you may not know, is the Jewish historian of London who's written about the Irish as much as the Jews of London. So it was a very unpredictable, but incredibly lively program from day one. Nobody needs to take any credit for it. It was someone opened the door, Lou and Lavetta, and look what fell in. A crowd of talent, of music, of literature, poetry, everything. We didn't have to really, didn't have to make any effort to make it any better. A gift, thanks to Lou and Lavetta. Miriam, Miriam, if I may, please. Um, and please let me know if, anyway. One of the wonderful things I need to have this group uh, be aware of is one of my touchstones in the very early years when truly we had no, we had no comp compass. We just knew what we wanted it to be, a joyous house for Irish American and Irish people. But Bob Scally said to me one evening after um, an another fabulous public event on a Thursday, uh, Remember, Bob, when you said I was talking to my mother and telling her about Luxman Ireland House and how it has just grown and evolved so quickly. And your mother said there must have been a need. Yes, I remember that very well. <laughs> and I, I always thought that could be our motto. There must have been a need. Yeah, it's right on the nose. It Scallon. sure was a need. Exactly. It, it corresponded by accident, by history with a, a, an explosion of creativity in Ireland and in America, Irish America as well, in the 1990s. We couldn't miss. There was a flow of talent and music and poetry and literature uh, that in the 1990s that made almost every event more and more exciting. It was a great decade for Irish arts. Absolutely. Bob, prior to that, um, were, were, did you know David Green, who, you know, a renowned scholar of Singh and O'Casey and someone um, after his death, his family were very generous in terms of giving his library to Luxman Ireland House. Were you aware of David's presence and work in the, an interest in the Department of English at NYU or was that? Uh, Only distantly, I didn't know him personally. And so um, it was, I heard about it after, it was already in progress. So I had nothing to do with creating that. Mm -hmm. um, so then, so, and, but it also, there's the kind of ser almost serendipitous or, you know, Ireland House comes just before some real flourishings in terms of Irish culture on the world stage, as you mentioned, Bob. Um, but it also, 
um, you, if I'm not mistaken, you were working on your your monograph at this point, um, end of Hidden Ireland, right? It, did it coincide nicely in that sense? Yeah, I was working on nothing else but that. <laughs> Actually, uh, it was a, a, a coincidence that, that Dennis Donahue and I were there for many years before the Ireland House opened. And when it, we, were, we were invited to participate in and create a program, we were completely lost. We didn't have an idea, any idea what to do. So Dennis volunteered to give a, a talk and I volunteered to give a talk. And we thought, well, that's what, the sort of thing that we'll be doing in Ireland House, but there'll be meetings of all kinds. And what happened in the very next semester after the, the kind of uh, half-baked half program we started with, there was a flow of, of, of talent. Both of us became aware that we weren't aware of before of a flow of talent and creativity that was occurring in the 1990s. That was a boom, the best, the best thing and the second renaissance of Irish creativity in the arts. And all we had to do really uh, is to make a call and say, can you come to New York? And from there on, there was a, a, a gold mine of talent of every sort of music and art and literature and scholarship. Uh, then, only then, <laughs> a, year, a year or two after that, did the students at NYU become aware of Irish studies and it became very popular for, for all the, the, the usual obvious reasons, really great literature, great film, great music, great poetry. And so from there on, Dennis and I just kind of uh, floated along with it. It, we didn't have to do a whole lot to create to create Ireland House. It was there, and there obviously was a, a, a dire need for it in New York City. And, and it was also Bob, you know. Then you know when you look back on it in terms of, you know, that um, the interest in the famine as a topic, and you know, Marion Casey contends, um, and and Terry has it in the the history that. Um, I believe it's 1997, that big conference on the on the famine at which uh, mm -hmm. Mary Robinson gives a keynote address, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, if I'm not mi uh, mistakenly paraphrasing, Marion contends that that conference intellectually was very significant in terms of putting Glucksman Ireland House and NYU on the map in terms of that kind of really rigorous engagement with a huge... Um, Irish topic in Irish history. Can you speak to that a little, Bob? Well, I do think that that uh, uh, convention is, uh, is the usual word to describe it. It had a lively quality to it that most historical conventions just didn't have. It's just talent, personalities. Uh, that made us more visible than we had been up till that time. In fact, it, it put us into a totally new category. From that point on, I think people were much more aware of the existence of Glucksman Ireland House than they had been, you know, the five years before. Uh, so again, the momentum carried us on its own into the late '90s and early early 21st. So uh, we we don't really have to take much credit for it ourselves. Well, that's not that's not good. Loretta. <laughs> Not Loretta or anyone, please come in at any point in time, you know, so please don't don't be shy about uh, interjecting or or anything. Um, one of the things that I've noticed at my time at Duxman Ireland House and we're still the beneficiaries of is the, our board. And it seems from the oh, yes. days, Loretta, mm -hmm. there were these really, really, you know, you use the term rock star and truly some like really great rock star members of an advisory board. And that even today differentiates us from most other parts of the university in terms of that combination of external advice from a really accomplished field, uh, people in, a, in an array of fields. Was that Lou's idea? The board, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, not per se. You see, Miriam, I don't really have a firm memory of any isolated idea It all. <laughs> It's, it's like baking bread, you know, you just, you put the stuff in the bowl and, and you touch it with love and you hope nice things happen. And indeed, it's a lovely loaf of bread, <laughs> but it hasn't 
it wasn't scientifically designed by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Bob is attesting. But yeah. it did, we had so many um, good winds at our back. And as Bob has said, part of it was the uh, tidal wave of interest in all, all things Irish, the culture, uh, the literature, of course, with Seamus. It just was great timing. And I always think that's a happy accident. I don't know anyone that can time yeah, yeah. events of, around history. It, it's just sheer Irish luck. Yeah. Um, uh, in that, uh, Hazia, when did you like get involved in any meaningful oh, way yeah. with Ireland House? I, I was trying to remember when you came to NYU or how did yeah. you remember how that all happened? Uh, vaguely. Um, so, <laughs> um, so for one thing, I was at that um, famine conference and mm. um, it was remarkable. And, you know, I'd be, I was invited to speak. And so it was obviously after um, Aaron's Daughters in America had come out. And I think it was also after the New York Irish volume had come out, which I was involved with. And um, uh, and then I got this invitation to come to this famine conference. And what struck me um, at it, uh, besides the fact that I was so honored to be asked, uh, was um, the high quality of the papers, but also the breadth of um, scholarship and that this concept of the Irish famine was connected and linked to so many other world events and to so many other histories. And rather than being a parochial slice of a small place over about a five year period, it was expansive and um, it gave me a, a kind of understanding that uh, um, to define a project um, doesn't limit it. And um, that is in a way, one of the things I've taken away from Ireland, Ireland House in general, but it was really that uh, um, uh, um, conference that was my first exposure to NYU and Ireland House. And I think I can, I, you know, I was trying to figure out when did I come to NYU? And I think it was 98. So it must've been a year later and, and yeah. And um, uh, um, it was immediately exciting for me to think I was in the same place with, uh, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, incubator of, um, of historical research and of programming and of, um, making connections and that is if the word so far i've heard a lot in these last few you know in loretta's words and bob's about um i think so, one of you said look what fell in the door and serendipity and not by design i think the other part of it is um the way in which the the tentacles okay the reaching out and um seeing this in uh this issue uh, be it Irish American history, or in that case, it was the Irish Feminine, in uh, the broadest terms, and which is what I think the intellectual pursuit is, is, uh, you know, you have a project, you have something that you're interested in, and you see all the ways it connects to so many other things. And um, Ireland House has been that um, uh, for me, and has uh, really stimulated my thinking on a lot of other subjects. So, um, which is more than you asked. You want to know when I started. So it was at that No, 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 that's wonderful, <laughs> Hazia. No, no, that's more than what I, I, I wanted you to say. And it's wonderful. Um, I, I didn't realize that you had been um, present for, for that conference as well. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it, it just struck me when I was rereading Terry's history that um, how, you know, this fledgling institution um, intellectually was you know uh, capable of making its mark in a you know when you you know when you have the likes of mary robinson to give a keynote address that mm -hmm. that says something and um it speaks to so many of the themes as you you've just mentioned um joe i it's a little bit later i think your official date that you start as director is 2002 although i seem to remember you would maybe come over a little bit earlier um and when you came to Ireland House, um, and maybe, I, I don't know whether Bob wants to speak to it, but you know the political context in which Ireland House emerged in 1993, we were still in the midst of a conflict situation. 
by the time Joe you come, it's uh, uh, as director, it's post Good Friday Agreement and and things like that. But the the you, you, I mean, you're oh, you're very familiar with the the political way in terms of Irish history can be a political football. I, I'm wondering if you've any commentary in terms of decisions you made as a as director, how you how you came to the role, how you would navigate that kind of landscape in a time when things were still very fraught. Um. That's a big question, I know. That's a very profound question, yeah. I mean, uh, my, my memory has gone to pot, by the way. So, you know, it's uh, um, uh, in so far as I would remember, I'm not sure. No, all I can remember is, you know, I so thoroughly enjoyed my time in Ireland House. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there were tips from time to time and things like that. Uh, but uh, it, it was a dream. It was like living a dream the whole time, you know. Um, I couldn't have invented it if it hadn't happened. Simple as that. So I just have a, a feeling of, enormous gratitude, enormous affection. And um, I'm sure there were times when people said, what the hell is he doing here, you know? And there were probably times when I said, what the hell are they doing here? But but uh, it, 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 as far as I was concerned, it went to dream, simple as that. But, but, but you were careful, Joe, in terms of positioning Ireland House, and maybe this was coming off the back of, of Bob, because there would have been pressures in the 1990s in Irish America you know, sure. to, for, for Ireland House to take certain positions or uh, lean in certain directions in terms of Irish politics. And it seems to me that the history was always very careful. And also, it's not it's nice to hear Bob talking about that. Um, you referred to the, the Jewish scholar who um, who worked on the Jews oh, in London and the Irish in London in particular, how that kind of openness in terms of how Irish studies and Irish history was framed was really from the get-go. If anyone wants to. Well, it was, this is for Joe, but uh, if I may, Joe, um, there, Joe Lee coming, Bob had done the spade work and Bob, and as he graciously said, Dennis, God love him. Um, and then when, uh, Joe was available to come. It was just such a boost for all of us. And I remember a conversation with Bob um, when we we didn't even know for sure it was going to work, that he was going to come. So um, Joe Lee leaving Cork and coming to Washington Muse, that I think was seismic for us. It certainly was for me. I didn't know Joe, I certainly had met him, knew who he was, but um, to have him join our scholars, Bob and Dennis and the, the rest of the wonderful people, Miriam and Marion, um, Joe Lee gave us an imprimatur that was crucial at that time in our evolution on both sides of the water. And, I'll always be grateful for that, Joe. And I, oh, I've not you, really ever had a chance to say that to you, uh, but it was uh, just as when Bob took the wheelhouse when we first opened and Dennis sat in his little back office and everyone knew Dennis Donahue was on the premises. All of those seemingly easy uh, endemic events each one in its own right was seismic as far as being where we are today and when you, where you all have allowed us to come. It, it all kind of, yes, it fell out of the air, but each piece was, seems to be so well designed and I'm a great believer in Providence, never more so than in the evolution of, uh, of this wonderful Ireland house. So thank you, each and every one of you. So uh, that makes me the lucky one, because uh, I have inherited all, all the work that you've done. And I mean, I know that Ireland House came together through serendipity, but I know equally well that it, it came together through um, everything uh, that all of you on this uh, call uh, have done. And you know, I'm in my third year here, but I, I've known the house uh, for the previous 25 years. And I came down frequently from wherever I was. I launched my work there. I knew Bob, I knew Joe. Um, tell you a, 
story, um, good story, which happens to be true. Um, <laughs> so I uh, started my graduate work in American history in 1988. Um, and my mother and my sister uh, went to a public lecture by a historian called Hazia Diner, who was over from New York, um, <laughs> who was uh, launching a book um, called Aaron's Daughters in America. And they said, well, we, we picked up a, co a copy for you in case it should ever uh, prove- uh, Mount to anything. Uh, Hazia and I got to know each other <laughs> through uh, the Immigration and History, Immigration and Ethnic History Society, and then eventually through Ireland House. Um, I studied American history and Irish history together uh, uh, in graduate school. And um, one of the essays that had the most influence on me was by, by Joe Lee. And it, it wasn't Joe's uh, modernization of Irish uh, society, or it wasn't the big blue book. I read both of them as well. Not like it, you. Was anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, it was a book about the Riven Man. And um, um. it was such a rich essay because it, it made me realize that this just this wasn't just a black and white story. This wasn't good guys and bad guys. This wasn't Ireland against England. It opened up the whole complexity of um, Irish rural history for me. And then um, one of the favorite books I discovered, of course, was The End of, of Hidden Ireland uh, by Bob Scully, which I still teach. I taught it just a couple of weeks ago. I think I've taught it every year since it came out. So I feel like I'm in very good company. Um, Miriam, I met through um, ACIS uh, mainly at a couple of conferences. Um, uh, Loretta, I didn't have the pleasure to meet until we met first time in Cork uh, as the tra transition yeah. was being made and as, as I was considering the position and then uh, onwards to New York. So, so as I say, I'm the lucky one. I've inherited all of this. I wanted to comment just on one thing also that um, Bob had said about the explosion of interest in Irish culture in the 1990s, and that's when I was living in New York, and that's when I got to know um, Ireland House first. Um, the number of um, self-identifying Irish Americans went up to 44 million under Bob's watch. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, Joe kept it pretty much intact, and it's gone down a little bit under my watch. <laughs> so, so, so I'm working on that. But I mean, the point, the point there is that people choose what to call themselves. And in America, if they choose uh, Irish American, that's great. Uh, what really interests me about what we're doing at the moment is we're redefining uh, what uh, Irish and Irish American mean. And the biggest initiatives in that have been uh, Hassia and Miriam working on Jewish-Irish connections, and then Hassia's, uh, uh, Miriam's uh, public humanities initiative on black, brown, and green voices. So what it means to be Irish in America is up for grabs in a way that parallels what it means to, to be um, Irish in Ireland. So we worry a lot about ethnic fade. We worry that this is going to go away. We worry that there isn't a unifying political cause, that we don't have immigration. Uh, but what we do have uh, is really, really dynamic community that's being redefined all the time. And that's registered in the just the, the amount of interest in the programming uh, we're doing on that theme at the moment is, is phenomenal. So all, all, just, all good stuff from my perspective. Well, uh, yes, Kevin, thank you. Can I just come in, Kevin, and say, you know, the one ingredient um, that we had been missing and you deserve so much credit in a short period of time to, to bring your background and your own publication um, record and everything to it has been um, the, the new Luxman Irish Diaspora series with NYU Press. That, mm -hmm. as we look into the future, and it's something Joe was always, I, 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 I miss Bob, so I'm not sure if, if Bob used to talk about it. I imagine he did, yes. but I know Joe used to talk about it all the time in terms of getting our not our own research, although it's wonderful if we can publish in that way, but to bring scholarly attention to NYU and to Luxman Ireland House through NYU Press. And it's so exciting, I, you know, to see the interest in the community in terms of manuscripts coming in and interest. And um, mm -hmm. I just want to take this opportunity Kevin, to commend you on that because it's no um, small achievement and something that we were really lacking. Right. 
but you do it. <laughs> that's the that's the difference. You picked it up and and made it a reality, and it's just fabulous for us. Well, we we um you know we I, I I totally agree with the sentiment in terms of you know some of this is organic and the people involved um are bored at least from what I can see of the board and the commentary on the early earlier members of the board have been phenomenal. Um, NYU has historically, and you know, Bob, it's interesting to hear you talk about the early days in terms of the initial interest of students. And then under Joe's tenure, the, the, the uh, addition of the master's program and us moving in that vein. And um, the students are, you know, it's a great place to teach. I, you know, Kevin and any of you who teach at NYU uh, will attest to the caliber of students we get. And the faculty, I mean, we have really great faculty members. We have historically, and we attract some great faculty uh, colleagues in terms of wanting to come in and be at Luxman Ireland House and connected in some way. So all those elements, um, to your analogy of the brown bread, Loretta, which I, I love, uh, really just work together so well. Well, you know, what makes the place stand out compared to other programs, and maybe it's an obvious point for New York, is just the energy of the place. I mean, that's what I picked up on every time in the 25 years before I, I came down permanently, anytime I would step into the house, I was just amazed by the, the number of things that were going on. So, you know, in the until recently on a Thursday evening, we'd pack the house with 100 people. Uh, ju just the, the enthusiasm and energy for public program, I, th I think is really distinctive. Uh, of course, our numbers have gone up during the pandemic. We now get crowds right. of 250 people <laughs> yeah. um, from all over the world. And that's not trivial because, you know, we're, we schedule our events now for lunchtime New York so we can reach the Irish and UK and European audience um, and a national audience. And it's, it's really working. So that'll be a feature of the future that uh, obviously we don't want to overdo it. We're really looking forward to getting back to in-person when we can. Uh, we don't want to just graft on three or four Zoom events every every week on top of that. But we'll be doing events in this format and, and they really work. They're very successful. I would like to just say, you know, again, say one little thing, which is I think on some level, uh, what goes on at Ireland House is a perfect, um, example of the public humanities. You know that uh, uh, this is a topic now that uh, is uh, kind of gripping the field um, as universities are hiring fewer and fewer uh, faculty. And so we're now, we, we do have this PhD program or a track at NYU in the public humanities. And um, it seems to me, this is like a model, you know, that there's the scholarship, there's the, um, the archives um, that Marion um, uh, created. There's um, the broad um, outreach to the public and they work in synergy with each other. They're not um, sort of uh, siloed, uh, but rather um, Ireland House is a kind of living embodiment of um, the um, kind of mantra we say, which is history matters. Okay, or we could say the humanities matter and that people who might be, I don't know, dentists, accountants, uh, um, fill in the other, you know, potential, you know, occupations, retire, that their lives are really improved by, it, it, their lives are enriched um, by an encounter with um, the humanities. And um, here it is. Yeah. Um, Another that, element in this too, I think we have to, <laughs> to change the image of Irish studies in Ireland in general to a more cosmopolitan rather than provincial mm -hmm. perception. Mm -hmm. Irish studies was no longer some obscure, tiny country history. It's mm -hmm. worldwide. And I think our experience at, uh, at the Ireland House is that people of all kinds of backgrounds took a lot of interest in what we were doing. A lot of creative writers and musicians and poets. Uh, that is appealing way beyond just the Irish in America. It has a very, very broad audience that, that turned up again and again and again at the events at Ireland House. Yeah, but and Bob, that, that ver was very firmly rooted though on your scholarship, on Joe's, on Hazia's and on Kevin's, yeah. you know, that, you know, the stature of you all individually and the rigor that you bring to your work and your profiles. 
um, that that really does a lot to go against, as you know, Hazia says, who knew that Irish history could be so, you know, so rich or whatever. And and you you guys are the living embodiment of that. And that's what um, attracts in then the creative thinkers in terms of, you know, I saw that in particular with Joe, you know, the you know, writers and things like bouncing ideas off you in terms of Irish history and things like that, because they wanted to go to that font of knowledge uh, okay. in terms of how they were thinking about things. And, and, and that's uh, mm. really amazing to see. Uh, mm. We're coming close to time. Does anyone else want to, I just want to say how much of an honor it is for me and um, we, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to gather us all together, as I said, in this um, embrace of Zoom that we're doing to have the excuse to see you all together and uh, thank you for everything that you've done. And um, I'm you. confident that thank Kevin you. will, no pressure, Kevin, live up to the legacy of what's been <laughs> <laughs>